everybody. It's Thursday. It's 2 p.m. Eastern. You know what time that is. It's time for another Bold Leaders in Learning. I'm Brandon Busteed, president of University Partners at Kaplan, and I couldn't be more excited to talk with our guest today, Larry Rosenstock, who is the founder of High Tech High. Many of you in the education space have likely heard about High Tech High, uh, and based on some of the numbers that Larry just shared with me, uh, there's a good probability that some of you have visited a high tech high, uh, not just if you live in the United States, but from all over the world. So Larry, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, Larry's coming to us from San Diego. I would love to just start uh, before we talk about high tech high. You've got a fascinating background. would love to hear more about your background and then would love to just have you give us the, uh, the, the high level description of high tech high as well. Well, the, the, my background is apropos. I was a, I went to Brandeis where I was, I was studied with Abe Maslow, for those of you who know him, Hierarchy of Needs. I loved that man. I yeah. used to drive him home every night, so I get to talk to him some more. Yeah. I was also a film major. I made a film that was shown on public television, and it was uh, about a prison. Uh, I was very interested in prisoners' rights, and when that uh, film was shown, uh, they closed the prison down. It was the oldest prison in the United States. I won't name it, okay? And then I dropped out of law school with two classes to go uh, because I didn't have faith in the law, actually. And I was had an elderly African-American gentleman who was getting um, thrown out of his apartment because he had no money, and I took him to court and we won and we drove back in the rain and he said, you were pretty good back there. What are you with? Uh, you know, a lawyer. And I said, well, kind of. I said, what do you mean kind of? I said, well, I dropped out. He said, why did you drop out? I said, well, I had too much agency. I didn't need it anymore. And he, he, he gets out of the car <laughs> in the rain and he starts to close the door. And then he opens the door and says, if it's an opportunity to go to law school, what's it like to drop out of law school? And he slammed the door. So I took the last two courses. So I, <laughs> I learned from him. So basically, other than that, um, I love doing carpentry. I still do. Uh, I love making things, and I wanted to create always a school in which students were creating things and new things, new thoughts. So when we have uh, exhibitions, the places are jammed with parents and everybody, and that's what you want. And to get them into top colleges, and our data on that is quite strong. Just one quick thing I want to say is that we have uh, not quite a thousand kids in 16 schools. They're all independent, small schools that are public independent schools, and uh, they are about um, so they're about 70 percent um, of of. 70% uh, of color, they're about 50% free and reduced lunch, which is a poverty indicator, of course. And then they're about um, 11, 12% special ed, um, which is another conversation, of course. And 97% and up to this year, 97% have gone to college. And wow. we had a huge focus on college admissions for those who would not typically, and I mean good colleges. And that, and I always said to people from the very beginning, the better we are at getting kids into top colleges, the weirder that be. It's a compliment, you know. The weirder we can be. All right, we can we can, yeah. we, can we can take bigger steps if we do that. And that that was our strategy. Yeah, there's there's so much to to tell about the high tech high model. Um, as I mentioned to you, I know it's not part of your charter network, but I visited the the Napa Valley high tech high, which was largely built on the model of what you've created. And I mean, I was just blown away by it, Larry. It's hard to describe it until you know you've walked into one of these schools. You know, the energy, the vibrancy. Um, you know, I came into it because of the name, right? High tech high, thinking the story was going to be largely about use of technology, right? You know, one-to-one -one laptop devices and things like that. And that was certainly a part of the framework. But what jumped out to me was the incredible emphasis on project-based learning, right? Students with, you know, hands-on work, working in groups, teachers collaborating with the students, teachers uh, collaborating with other teachers, right? So the interdisciplinary collaboration within the building. And then one of the things that jumped out was the, the piece you mentioned, which is you know, instead of thinking about, you know, report cards and grades and test scores, you know, the big culmination uh, of student uh, output is a presentation of a project, right, where the community comes in to be the judges of it by, by way of uh, observing it. So just 
unpack some of that for me. I know there's there's several aspects of your your model or your pedagogy, but I would love people to really appreciate the uh, the, the critical nuances of what's made it so successful. Well, projects, and thank you for asking. I mean, I want to give a, a couple. Besides the books, the, I, I'm sitting in a room. I've got hundreds of books that are our students have published, first of all, mm. I mean, their own books. And, and, but last year, my, in my, my final year there, two rooms down from me, there were two teachers who had the idea uh, with their students two years prior to that, I said, I've been working on it for a few years, and that was about rocket ships. They were very interested, not for violence, of course. There is a place that is five hours north of here in the state of California where you can send up rockets. There are only three groups, to my knowledge, who can use that. The U.S. Navy, UCLA, Cal Berkeley, and High Tech High. And those students, first of all, I, did, um, I never left the East Coast when I moved here in terms of I get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> just, I'm, so so I, get, I get to Aitakai every morning very early. Those kids are there early every single day. And at the end of the day, they don't want to go home. That's when you know you've really got it going. And so when they sent up the last time before everything got a little bit disrupted with the planet a few months ago, as everybody who's listening knows, we have not been able to go back up there yet. But the last time that they sent their rocket up, it was 2% shy of breaking the sound barrier and they were going bananas over it. That's, and people can keep saying, what do, you, what do you mean? Kids did that? Yes. And, and oh, they were boys. They were 50-50 boys and girls, as a matter of fact. That's what it was. So we have so many stories, stories like that. It's all about that quality of work. And also um, English history, math and science. You know, you asked me about that before. I mean, that came from the committee of 10 in 1893. I mean, that was a, so you could say, well, wait a second. Doesn't it have to be English history, math and science? Yeah, but maybe there's yeah. more to it than that, what happened 100 years ago, right? So we try to do, we have to have one foot on that program so that, you know, the college isn't going to say, what, what does this mean? And on the other hand, you can be creative. So to anyone listening, yes, you can, you can do both. It's absolutely doable. And every one of our schools um, has a college placement officer, of course, uh, and every one of our college placement officer has one characteristic. They went, oh, uh, two. They went to, they were uh, uh, the first member of their family to go to college and they worked mm -hmm. at a highly selective college admissions office. Bingo. That's all you need. That's all we needed. And, and they're a fantastic group that have cultivated our kids going again until right now when everything's, let, let's be honest, everybody, everything's up yeah. in the air this year, but we know that we don't have to keep talking about that too much. It is. Yeah. Yeah, the um, uh, you know, I I uh, I saw it when I was in the building before I I heard it kind of quantified in writing. But you know, you guys have kind of four, I don't know, I call them guiding principles. You might have different terminology for it. Um, and in order, right? They're they're equity, personalization, authentic work, and collaborative design. And I know you've 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 already kind of touched on each of those by you know some of the various comments you've made, Larry. But you know, talk to me about how how you're doing all those things, because you're doing them all really well. And starting with the equity, right, you know, across the education sector, across uh, employers of all shapes and sizes, right, we continue to struggle with this challenge of equity and access in education. Um, I mean, we've made some modest progress at a national level, but not much, right? So if I look at uh, college going rates for the last half century, it's moved from about 6% to 9% among kids born in the bottom quartile. Um, so, I mean, which is to say it's hardly moved in half a century, right? But you, you guys have pulled this off. I mean, just, just tell me what was involved, right? I mean, I'm sure it was a commitment, but then there's a lot of action that goes behind that. I, I think a lot of us would just like to hear how you've been able to do it. Well, the first thing I want to say is when I was in the seventh grade, my math teacher was somebody named Bob Moses. Ah, oh, that's amazing. How it's, on earth? <laughs> it, it, and, I've, and I have 
been with him many times since. He even spoke at High Tech High. If you ever wanted to find a remarkable human being, I could go on about that for forever, but you've asked me a different question. But of course, I think about him right away because I, I, knew his, I know his family and we did various types of work together that helped me understand a fair bit of some of these questions, okay? So, and then of course his body of work is remarkable. However, to go back to it, one, one of the things that we wanted to do was observation, reflection, documentation, exhibition, which is what you're doing right now with me. So that was really what we wanted the school to feel like. In terms of questions of equity, how do you, when you have a school like this and it's a public school and the only way that people can get in is in a blind lottery, it's a blind lottery and it should be that way. It, it should not be anything other than that. And, and California allowed us to do that, okay? And yeah. so that, that meant that the demography is the one that I've told you earlier, okay? It is, you know, so, it's, it, so we have that group. And then what we're trying to do is have them work in teams, which is another very important thing for us all to learn how to do right. before we move on, is that you're working in, you're working in groups and, and you're observing, you're reflecting, you're documenting, and, you're, and, then, and then what a lot of people don't add is the exposition. When our students are showing their work at night, whether it's, whether it's early um, education or, or seniors, the schools are jammed with parents. You cannot believe they're all because they're because their their child said, "You have to come see what I did," or better yet, what we did, what we did. So that's how we sort of built it. And then the other thing, which I also mentioned, is every one of our college placement officers is first gener generation college uh, goer. So that has helped us sort of create the 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 Uber. Uh, uh, sense of this is a place that's the way it would be very simple for anybody. People say, how did you do this? I said, it was easy. All I had to do was ignore a few basic axioms as someone once famously said, you know, uh, that's how we did it. So that's our background. And it doesn't mean that it's, I don't, wouldn't want people to think it's too doctrinaire. It has a, because for those who visited, as you have, you have a different feel for it. You, the feel that you have when you come in is that everybody's busy. <laughs> you know, right. Everyone's got something to do. And yeah. uh, as opposed to, you know, um, other ways that schools that I have been in, you know, obviously, like everyone, I've gone to lots of different schools, you know, and um, back in New York City. So I know what it's like. Yeah. So that's yeah. okay. Yeah, I like your description about it feeling like it's busy in there. I mean, there was a real there was a real buzz and energy, and um, I would call it everybody was engaged, right? They were focused on something, they were involved in something, they were, you know, there was just that that energy. And I remember one of the one of the conversations I had uh, with one of the teachers who was kind of explaining to the group I was with, you know, how they do project based learning. Uh, somebody, you know, somebody asked her. Um, well, you know, so how did you get to become good at project-based learning, right? And she said, well, I was never trained in it. You know, I got here, I started teaching. She said, it took me a semester before I got used to it. She said, but I started to, you know, learn from other teachers in the building and I got pretty good at it. And then they asked me if I would start teaching the other teachers as a formal role, right? Teaching them project-based learning. And it was just really interesting because I know as part of your model, at least I think, you guys have also really created um, professional development tracks That's for cool. teachers. And, you know, one of the fundamental changes that we're going to have to, um, you know, usher in across the education sector, if we're going to move to a model that's, that's like a high tech high model, is getting teachers more comfortable with project based learning. Just tell me a little bit about the teacher, you know, kind of how long does it take a teacher to get into the swing with the, the kind of model at high tech high? and a little bit about how you're doing professional development now for other teachers. Okay, well that's, those are uh, two great questions. For one, we've got 16 schools, okay? And so um, we didn't plan on building that many, but we did, and they're all roughly in the metropolitan area of San Diego, because uh, uh, we don't want to drive to a school that's you know, too far, or be responsible for one. And so that means that there are, set, there, that means that there are 16 people, each of whom run a school, and it's their school. 
and yeah. they're independent of each other, except there's an elementary and there's a middle and there's a high in each setting. And early Monday morning, all of those people, all of those 16 people and I would meet and talk. And I found myself intentionally over the years, this is actually my best answer to your question, being quieter and quieter and quieter because I was needed less and less and less so that they understood this is your baby. This is, you've got this and there's gonna be a big exposition coming. And how do you wanna look? I know how everybody else wants to look. How's, what is the status of that work that your students are doing when everybody comes in to do that? And then what about this question of English history, math and science, can we talk about that? Where do we put that in the context of all of this? It's not very difficult mm -hmm. to do. What about observation, reflection, documentation and exhibition, just as you're doing right now by interviewing me? All of these things are just to us so obvious. There's nothing really like, gee, how do you think about that? They're just obvious things that people do. And, and remember, take Erwin Jacobs, for example, who merely <laughs> invented cell phones. Uh, you, know, <laughs> um, you know, he wanted us to expand the range of demography of people of the 2,500 that were making the chips for these things. And he wanted, and he wanted a school called High Tech High School. And would I create one called High Tech High School? And I said, uh, if I can take the word school off it, yes. And that's how we got started. <laughs> I don't like the word school sometimes. <laughs> that's fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, speaking about technology now, we actually just got a question from one of our colleagues who's joining us, uh, Sonny, who's at, interested in what kind of tech platform and tools are the underpinnings of the of the high tech part of what you guys are doing? Well, I hope I could, since he's a tech person, he's probably a lot sharper than I am. Okay, so so I'm gonna there's I have worked my own sector as two of them. One of them is was is carpentry. So I can definitely teach that one myself. <laughs> really what I'm doing right now that I'm retired. And and the other one is filmmaking. So that's another one. But very, very two different powerful things that I have professionally studied, got degrees in, and all that kind of stuff. For mm -hmm. other people. Um, like I mentioned, my son, who's do, he's doing quantum physics. He went to high tech high, he went to Cal Berkeley, and now he's doing quantum physics, whatever that is. I don't understand it, but so far he's going from step to step. There's other people that are doing, or, the, or when I talked about the rocket ships, I mean, obviously it's, uh, this person who's asking the question might know um, uh, more than I do. What is it that gets a rocket ship that's sent up by teenagers to break the sound barrier? What had, it, what had to go into that? I, know, I, I can tell you that it took three, month, three years of work to do that, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, I'm, but I'm not the person to answer about the technology, uh, but I could put him in, in with the people that are the smart ones that, that do know how to do it. And it was actually, it was, it was two science teachers who were wondering what they should do next. I remember that about three or four years ago. And, and the rest was a big explosion when they said, well, I like this and I like that. Let's put them together. What's that gonna do for us? And poof, who thought right. they'd be sending up rocket ships? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's an example, I think of what's happening with both the students and teachers in an environment like this, right? Which starts to feed off of itself in various ways. Like your point about the, you know, the teachers and school leaders getting increasingly comfortable with the project-based learning model and, you know, to a place where, you know, they needed your input less and less, uh, you know, these are things that get picked up. Uh, it, it reminds me too of the, um, you know, the Latin root of the word education uh, means to lead out of. And I, I've, I've always liked to mention this in speeches because it doesn't mean to stuff into, right? And I think that a lot of our kind of educational design in schools has been about trying to stuff knowledge into students, right? Rote memorization and, right, you know, you, you know these are the ways things have been done. But, but when I think about high tech high, I think about that as a place that leads something out of a student, right? Where they're the ones who are in the self-design and creation phase. And so the answer is, you know, uh, it sounds like, a lot of the a lot of the tech that powers high tech high is determined by the teachers and students based on what they want to accomplish. And that's why when you or, or, or guests are there, we have students take them around, not adults. So so the students will you know because they and they're talking talking talking. My favorite one um, is called 
Yes. Jazz in the bathroom. Okay. In the original high tech high in the boys bathroom uh, near my office. I don't know how they did this, but it was about eight years ago. Some, some boys figured out a way to have jazz going on nonstop in that room. And here it is eight years later. You could go in there in the summer. You could go there in the winter. It is always playing different jazz all the time. I made the unfortunate mistake because it was a, a woman who was visiting and she said, oh, but what would be a really great thing for me to see? I said, oh, how about jazz in the bathroom? And I said, oh, wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> I have to get it emptied out first before you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's pretty funny. Yeah, there were, there were you know, the um, couple other examples I think about uh, as, as students, you were right. They were the ones that were the guides when I was in the, you know, the Napa Valley school. And, um, you know, one of the things they were reflecting on was, uh, I'll call it iteration, right? And um, a, a critical concept, I think, for learning. Um, but they were talking about how, as they were creating their project, they were constantly getting a lot of feedback from their teacher, from fellow students, Yes. And they were going back to the drawing board. So this one student talked about how their first presentation of their uh, project really failed, yes. went back to the drawing board, had to redo it all. But they, they were talking about the value of the process of iteration. And that's another thing that I feel like we're missing, you know, in this kind of drive for perfection, you know, with the students and, and, and parents that are obsessed with, you know, perfect test scores and perfect grades. And I've got to get into the perfect college you know, we, we don't, we don't leave room for making mistakes and, you know, creating messes at points and right. Like, I, I'm just curious how you deal with that tension of kind of the broader society around, you know, we're, we're aiming for perfection versus, yes. you know, learning from failure or iteration. Tell me, tell me how you're dealing with that. I need to give examples. Okay. So you're, you're reminding me of somebody who was one of our first students. Uh, so that was 20 years ago and he was a freshman and he's Korean immigrant, and he had done something very, very sophisticated, and all the parents were coming that night to the ninth grade, and the thing he'd worked on so much, it wasn't working. It, he had it working, and it wasn't working. He has a remarkable sense of humor, and I went down the hallway, and he was walking back and forth saying to himself, I am Korean, I will not fail. I am Korean, I will not fail. I am Korean, I will not fail. This is what he's like. He, okay, he did make it work. He did go to college. He did major in science. He was in Chicago doing that. He, two years ago, moved back. He is teaching science in the same room that he said that in at high tech high and his mom, awesome. when i got him back because she has a little restaurant his mom who's tiny saw me and threw her arms around me for bringing her son back home so anyway and he is absolutely one of the best teachers i have ever seen in my life so that's the other thing is when you right. when you bake them and then they, you, you try to get them back at them back because they understand the schools inside out and of course he's great at math even though he couldn't make it work that day. He's fantastic at math. <laughs> yeah, those are, well, that, that's, a, that's a great story. I'm sure you've got uh, hundreds or thousands of those stories over the years with students. You know, the, the other thing I, I just thought I'd touch on too um, that I thought was fascinating was uh, one of the classrooms I visited, the, uh, the teacher was using the Socratic method in the class, right? And so again, another thing I was surprised at, I'm like, wait a minute, this is supposed to be high tech high and we're using this you know, ancient Socratic method, but um, like these are the things that are happening where, where I, you know, the teacher said, you know, he was, he was describing how the class started and he just stood there and he waited for the students that, you know, the students were waiting for him to say something. He didn't say anything. And finally a student was like, are you going to teach us anything? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, he, and the Socratic method is also, is also law school, right? Yeah. Okay, so when I was up, uh, I think Berkeley is just a phenomenal university, and I was there, and a friend of mine from Harvard was now running the, the grad school up there, and she said, I want you to teach a course. I said, well, my son's here, I'll teach it, you know, so I'll visit him, and I, what do you want to teach? New school creation. Why? No one's ever taught a course in new school creation, and I got people coming, and you're asking questions about how do you start a school? So the way that I taught the class was the first week on Thursday night was, where's the school? 
and the next week was what's the building and the next week was how do you select the adults and the next week was how do you select the kids and the last week was what are they all doing and then the next year she said will you teach it again and i said yes if i can do it backwards so that's the other thing about it is that yeah. for you as a as a practitioner don't get stuck keep playing with it playing with it playing with keep your you want to do it backwards you want to do it forwards you want to have both of them right at the tip of your fingertips at all times and that's what you're trying to do with kids i think as well yeah I, th look that's that's great advice for all of us you know even adults who are in the workplace right you know to to think about you know reflecting on the process or a meeting that took place and re-engineering parts of it if you're not comfortable with how it went right like i, I think that you know that's a really powerful reminder now I know we've only got a, a few minutes left. I want to make sure we touch on uh, the incredible accolade and award that you received last year. So uh, some people are aware of this award. The, the, it's called the Wise Prize. And uh, I mean, it is literally the, you know, the equivalent of a Nobel Prize in education. Uh, it comes with a substantial monetary uh, contribution. Uh, in any event, you were awarded this prize uh, roughly a year ago for your work with High Tech High. Um, Tell me a little bit about what, what has happened since you were, uh, you know, uh, anointed this uh, Wise Prize recipient and a little bit of what you're doing as a result of it. Okay, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, of course, um, it was a wonderful surprise, <laughs> uh, truly. And, and it was also interesting because it was in December and had it been delayed like everything else in the world was, I often wonder what might have happened. However, I, I was asked... Uh, to go to Dakar and I and, and went there in a brand new, unbelievable theater that fits 3,500 people in which I've seen, I've never, I never heard of a lot of the countries of people that were there. And I had lunches with all the different people there. And I, I did with, with Her Highness as well, every one of those three days. Uh, I had to speak each of those three days. There are also famous actors and actresses and singers, there was a lot, there was a lot going on. Uh, there were a lot of countries I'd never heard from. And what I think is most interesting uh, to people is that when I, the th third time I talked with Her Highness, she said, what are you going to do with it? I want you to know that you, you may do whatever you want to with this. And I said, well, I appreciate that. Um, here's what I'm gonna do with it. Um, we are going to, put together the best collection of projects of our students' work over the last 20 years. We're going to put them digitally um, and in book form, digital for free, of course, for the entire world, because I said to her, I know you feel as I do that it's about the world. It's not about just any place. It's truly about the world. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to do with it. And she was very honored that that's what, that, that we clicked and I already knew I was getting it and that's what we were going to do. So now, um, in another room and actually digitally, some other people, um, they have, I'm in my home, by the way, like a lot of people, um, we have just about finished the six months of the best projects and it's not even fair to say the best projects because some of them are not there and you know what i mean but uh, but still that's the language that, that was being used and now um with the money that is left over and there was a sizable amount of money that she gave um i am going to use that when it's safe and possible with some uh, peers that i work with and stuff uh, different ones at different times. I want to go around the world and 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 show our work and instigate some of their work of saying basically this you can do, this you can do as well. I talked to a very large group in Australia yesterday, for example, and 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 at the end I said, you know, and I'm, I'm I've been there several times and I really look forward to coming back. I just have one small concern, and someone said, "What's that?" I said you all drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and if I were driving in a roundabout, uh, it wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure you'll find a way to get over that hurdle of driving on the other side of the road. Um, 
And, you know, for those before, you know, I'd be remiss not uh, double clicking on your your comment about um, Bob Moses. You know, I so one of the for those who don't know him, one of the less heralded heroes of the civil rights movement, quite frankly, uh, but has been a pioneer. Uh, there's a book called The Algebra Project, which is about the work he's been doing teaching algebra to underserved students. And if you if you haven't read about Bob Moses or heard about The Algebra Project, pick up a copy. Uh, I, I'm just jealous that you, you know, know him and had, inter- and I mean, between Maslow and Bob Moses, man, you, you know, you, you hit the lottery. <laughs> he was really pretty good. And after this conversation, I'm going to call Bob because um, he's one of a kind. He is truly one. And, and, and he taught me math in the seventh grade. <laughs> so, yeah. And good. I, good. Yeah. I've never met him, but my connection to him via uh, was through one of my professors, Bruce Payne, who organized with him uh, during the civil rights movement. And Bruce taught the history of the civil rights through uh, a number of incredible books, Taylor Branch's books. Um, and so, you know, I've been a Bob Moses fan since I was in college, thanks to thanks to a, a teacher mentor of mine. But um, in any event, Larry, thanks for joining us today. Congratulations on the incredible work you've done and uh, and are going to continue to do as you uh, travel the world once uh, the world returns to traveling. So thanks so much for your time today. It's a pleasure. And as I say goodbye, the last time I saw Abe Maslow, because I drove him home from college every day because we had a great relationship. The last time I saw him and then he passed. As he was getting out of my little funky car, he said, I'm happy, happy, happy. And he was, and I am. Thank you. That's terrific. That's a terrific ending. Well, thank you, sir, and uh, look forward to staying in touch. I Very much so. Thank you.